Okay, so here, this is poliovirus replication, positive sense RNA. Once again, the same replication strategy, but the reason I like this slide from an old version of your textbook is that it shows classical attachment, penetration, uncoding, so we have a positive sense viral RNA, but then it, it nicely shows that we have uh, ribosomes hook up with this positive sense RNA, not using an iRes this time, but ribosomes are making proteins, so they're making all these structural proteins, so the structural proteins are made here, and then in a vesicle, this positive sense RNA goes over and um, uh, a, uh, an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from the protein that was made here comes over here and starts making negative sense RNA. Okay, so remember, you start with your genome as positive, then the RNA polymerase makes a negative sense RNA, and the negative sense then forms template for more genome. So this is all your genome down here. This is just a template for your genome, and then this is kind of like the starting material for the virus, so the starting genome of the virus. Okay, and then you can follow this, this through. All right, so now let's move to uh, influenza virus, which is arguably perhaps more interesting uh, because it's a problem every year, and maybe some of you had influenza virus this year. I know my 16-year-old son was out for a week with influenza virus, so it's a uh, kind of a bad guy. So influenza A virus is the one we're talking about. There's A and B. Um, a is the, is the one that we worry about every year. It's an orthomyxovirus. It's in that, that family. <clears throat> about 36,000 deaths per year in the U.S., um, uh, but it infects really about 10% of the population every year. So, so uh, what's the, the U.S. population? Is it, is it uh, three, 300 million, I think? Maybe my numbers are wrong. Uh, so that's a big number. Uh, lots of people sick with influenza. Obviously, there's a, there's a big problem. Uh, periodic pandemic. So sometimes we have, um, sometimes Asian flu comes across uh, the United States. Sometimes we get it from Australia, lots of different places. Uh, it's, a, it's a history maker. So in 1918, more people died uh, from influenza that died in World War I. So uh, we should have a war against viruses instead of a war against uh, uh, people. Uh, 2009, we had swine flu. That was kind of a, a, a false alarm, a mild illness, but nonetheless, um, it's something to look out for. Uh, so the, the thing we're going to talk most about is that influenza has a segmented genome. So it is negative sense RNA, but it actually has eight separate linear strands of negative sense or antisense RNA, okay? So, so that means that a ribosome can't hop right on that negative sense because it won't make the right amino acids. It'll just make, it'll be nonsense protein. It just won't make the right thing. So, so it, it has to get positive. It's, if it starts out negative, it has to get positive. And remember, positive is viral RNA, viral messenger RNA. <clears throat> Okay, so the flu virus uh, really has no real capsid, and one of the answers to your uh, clicker questions was the virus has to have a capsid in a genome. Well, um, influenza has kind of a capsid. We, we call it a, a matrix, but it still looks a little bit like a, like a capsid. But what influenza has instead is it has a nucleocapsid, and what these are is that the nucleocapsid is this light blue, and that coats the negative sense uh, RNA, the eight strands of negative sense RNA. And then it also has uh, associated with it an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So the reason influenza has to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is because uh, it's a negative sense virus. If it's a positive sense, it could just hook up with a ribosome and make an RNA polymerase, but this is a negative sense. So if it would try to make an RNA polymerase, it would just be nonsense. So it has to carry one with it. So that's the secret. Negative sense RNA viruses have to carry their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So you should say that in your head a few times. Okay, and it also has two major envelope proteins neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. So if you hear 
People say H5N1 or H9N7. So H means hemagglutinin and N means neuraminidase. And these are uh, based upon the sequences and the tropism of, uh, this, that's how, kind of how we type the viruses. <clears throat> so here's the, the structure of the virus here. So here is um, a hemagglutinin, here is neuraminidase. Uh, there's an ion channel called M2 right here that actually turns out to be really important. Uh, the hemagglutinin is the thing that binds, this is the viral receptor that binds to respiratory epithelium. And you know that this is the genome inside here, and you know that this green is, is the matrix, which we'll just kind of call a pseudocapsid, <clears throat> even though the nucleocapsid is really uh, protecting the RNA. Okay. Uh, so, so this is kind of, you know how we have 23 chromosomes, right, 23 pairs. Uh, influenza has eight segments. So it's kind of like a mini cell, even though it's a virus, it's not a cell. <clears throat> so there are, there are three components of this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. There's a, there's a gene, or an, an RNA for, for hemagglutinin, an RNA for the nucleocapsid. Here's an RNA for neuraminidase, an RNA for the matrix protein. Here's some other non-structural proteins that virus uses, proteases and things like that. And here's this M2 ion channel, which is kind of important. Okay, so with all these segments, and the, so, the, so the virus attaches to the cell, uh, penetrates, gets inside, and then these segments start uh, uh, being replicated, because remember the job of a virus is to replicate its genome. So it's forming a uh, positive sense intermediate and then a lot more negative strand. Uh, each, each of these uh, segments are going to, there's going to be lots of each of these negative segments and they're all going to be packaged in various, or in, in viruses that are going to be released from the cell. So the question here is what happens if one or more of the RNA segments don't get packaged? And if this were a live class, I would take some answers, but um, actually the, the, the answer is that that virus might be able to infect and get inside of a cell, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be released as an infectious virus. Because <clears throat> if, so let's just say one of these subunits of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is not packaged, then once, that's, once that virus gets inside of a cell, it's not going to have the instructions to make a new RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it may get inside of a cell, but it's not going to be able to replicate itself. And if it doesn't have a hemagglutinin, so, so here it, it, it may be able to get inside of a cell, but when it tries to make a new virus, it doesn't have any hemagglutinin. So any virus it, it releases won't be able to infect any other cell because this is the viral receptor for uh, what is sialic acid on a host cell. Okay, so, and, and this happens actually a lot. The virus doesn't care, it doesn't count and figure out which of the, of the segments it's gonna package. As a matter of fact, the majority of virus that's produced is not infectious. I mean, it may take uh, six non-structural proteins and two hemagglutinins and forget all these, and that virus is not infectious. But all it takes is a few infectious viruses and we can get thousands of viruses out of an individual cell. So even though it's inefficient, um, it's still a problem. <clears throat> all right, so this is a, a uh, picture from your book that talks about uh, the segmented genome. And the segmented genome facilitates recombination between two strains of viruses. That would be like H5N1 in co-infecting a cell that already has, for example, H, H3N2 or H7N9 which I think is the one that's going around this year. Uh, so, so two different strains of virus can infect the same cell. So I looked at this, at this uh, diagram that your book has and I thought, wow, what a horrible way to, um, to kind of diagram recombination and what this is actually is antigenic shift. And we'll talk about that in a second. I thought a much better way is to, uh, to, to, to uh, communicate 
uh, what's going on here is, is with this picture so, uh, and this text right here. So <clears throat> we already know that, that pigs can get flu, so it's called swine flu, right? And we already know that these little guys are, are wonderful little creatures covered with a thin layer of infectious disease. Uh, so imagine the scenario where this little, this little guy comes from, guy or girl perhaps comes from uh, preschool, may have early influenza, not showing symptoms yet, and goes to the zoo on a field trip, something, and uh, what if this pig also has influenza, <clears throat> maybe has swine flu? Uh, so, so remember, we talked about two different strains of virus infecting the same cell. So this is how it happens, right here. Two different strains infecting the same cell. We can also have two different strains from two different humans infecting the same cell. But this is how something called um, antigenic shift happens. This is a reassortment of influenza gene segments. Okay, so some from the pig, like an H9 from the pig, and also uh, and then the rest of the virus would be human, for example. So here's another example right here from, from several years ago. Uh, Sumeya Memek considered the chickens in her backyard to be beloved pets. The eight-year-old girl fed them, petted them, and took care of them. Uh, when they started to die, she hugged them uh, tenderly and kissed them goodbye. The next morning, her face and eyes were swollen and she had a high fever. Her father took her to a hospital. Uh, five days later, she was confirmed to have H5N1 strain of bird flu. So once again, um, this, this, this virus, the influenza virus can hop from animals to, to people and perhaps people to animals as well, although I wouldn't... Um, Probably we wouldn't care too much if the, if the human gave the animals uh, in, in a flu infection, but we do care if animals give people flu inf infection. So, so the antigenic shift really is the important one here, and that's reassortment of gene segments. Those, those were all those, these gene segments <clears throat> here. Um, one, one of these, for example, would be uh, when two viruses co-infect the same cell, you can get a hemagglutin in from the swine, from the pig, and also uh, a nuclear protein from the human and other proteins from human. The virus can still replicate, but now it, it's, it can replicate in, in human cells. And we don't have immunity to, so, so that's the problem, is, is suddenly, you know, we're, we're, we're immunized against maybe uh, H1N1, but we don't have any immunity to um, H, H9N7. Okay. Antigenic drift are just mutations in the flu genome. So that's, so remember, you still have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase here, and RNA polymerases are not good at fixing mutations, not like DNA polymerases are. So RNA polymerases make lots of mutations, and because they make lots of mutations, we have mutations here and there in the flu genome. Those aren't nearly as serious as antigenic shift, which is actually reassortment of, this, of the gene segments of influenza. Okay, so uh, let's go through how influenza binds and infects a cell. So influenza binds via hemagglutinin onto sialic acid. So this is a cartoon of, of what sialic acid might look like on a cellular protein. So here's uh, a human sialic acid, probably in the upper respiratory tract and nasal uh, pharyngeal epithelium with a 2,6 linkage. And here is uh, an, an H5N1 avian influenza strain that actually prefers to bind to a 2,3 linkage. Of, and these, these look pretty similar uh, structurally. And as a matter of fact, uh, we actually have the 2,3 linkage deeper inside our respiratory epithelium. So, so that's another reason how uh, an avian or a non-human strain can infect humans, is we do have this structure which avian influenza prefers deep inside or, or lower down in our respiratory epithelium, which could also result in a more severe disease. Okay, so, so we, had, we had binding here, and now we have, so this is the cellular receptor, so now it's in an, uh, the uh, virus here is in an endosome, and uh, this is the 
the sialic acid containing protein, and we have the hemagglutinin binding to this. <clears throat> and you already know that if you have an endosome, then you fuse with a lysosome, and lysosome has a low pH, has digestive enzymes in it. We already kind of talked about the immunology there. We're going to get influenza peptides that are going to be put out onto MHC. However, now we're in our virology section. What we're going to be talking about is um, how the virus replicates. So uh, this M2, this ion channel, this gene here that I mentioned was kind of important. So uh, this is kind of a, a snorkel for the virus where uh, the uh, acidic environment can enter the uh, matrix of the virus and then release the nucleic acid, the negative sense RNA that's kind of strapped in to the, to the virus. So the acidic environment here denatures the, um, the nucleic acid, the negative sense RNA, and allows it to kind of float around inside there. And the other thing that the uh, acidic environment does is it, it allows the, uh, it denatures the hemagglutinin, and then the hemagglutinin can fuse, or, or actually kind of, we'll say fuse with, uh, or integrate into the endosomal membrane. And then once the endosomal membrane uh, is integrated with hemagglutinin, then you can see that the, these membranes fuse and the, the uncoating of the virus can occur. Okay? So this is the whole thing. I would encourage you to go through the whole thing here. You don't really have to memorize this, uh, this molecular interaction here, but you do need to, to know that there's an acidic environment here that releases the, the, uh, the, the, the segmented genome of the virus, and then we get a fusion of the viral membrane with the endosomal membrane releasing the segmented genome which actually enters the nucleus. So even though this is an RNA virus, the RNA, uh, the, the RNA segments enter the nucleus and begin a, a chapter of replication. So I would encourage you to, to watch the movie. Once again, Norton has, has a movie. The movie or the animations are very good. Uh, they explain things perhaps in a different way that I explain it, and uh, this, this helps. So go to this site, watch that movie. So after watching the movie, you may uh, want to uh, want to revisit this. So here's influenza binding to the antigen. I'll just go through it. So we have uptake of the virus. Here's an endosome. We get um, uh, fusion of the, of the endosome with a lysosome. We get the release of RNA, okay? And once the negative sense RNA is released, then it can go into a vesicle. Uh, and it does something called uh, cap snatching. So it takes a 5' cap from a cellular RNA and it puts it here so that uh, we can get uh, a, uh, a, a translation. And uh, once the, uh, the viral uh, uh, segments are translated, then the proteins start to migrate out through the Golgi into the or through the ER into the Golgi, and they start to line up on the surface here. And also remember that we, since this is a negative strand of RNA, we have to go through a positive intermediate with our uh, RNA polymerase to make more of the genome, which is negative strand RNA. Okay, so the genome then hooks up again with it just pulls random segments. Remember, not all, especially, well, uh, the minority of, of virus or segments that get in here are actually the correct one through eight, and it may even have some extra ones in there, it doesn't matter, uh, that, that get into each virus, and then the virus buds from the cell.